Yeah, I will in good to go. All right. Isaac Asimov once said, education isn't something you can ever finish. It's the 6th of March and it's yet another day to learn something new and gather knowledge. Good afternoon, everyone. I extend a warm and hearty welcome to you all to this online continuing pharmacy education program organized by the Goa State Pharmacy Council and the Indian Pharmaceutical Association's Community Pharmacy Division. Next. So today we will be having three expert speakers for this webinar. We hope you all have an enriching experience today with the wonderful speakers we have lined up for you. Next. We would like to thank our team who helped with logistics for the CPE, Mr. Mahindra Naik, Mr. Ratnadeep Kutkarkar, Mr. Arun Kuryalkar, Mr. Omkar Zambavlikar, Mrs. Nilima Michel, Mr. Mandar Joshi, Mrs. Pooja Kamat, Mr. Jyotendra Sambari, Mrs. Sucheta Thakur, Mr. Yogendra Kanchapu, Mr. Vailab Desai. So today for our technical support for, the, for today's CPE, we have Yogendra Kanchapu, who is a PharmD graduate. He is the president of IPA Student Forum 2022. He was the ex-co member of IPA CPD for the 2020-2022 mandate. He is the associate editor of E-Times IPA CPD. We also have Kash Shah, who, is, uh, who has an MBA in Pharma Tech. He is also the media team member of the IPA Student Forum Public Relations Subcommittee for this year. So I will be the moderator for today's session. I'm from Goa itself, but currently I'm pursuing my third year of PharmD from Kaley College of Pharmacy. I'm currently a part of the publications team of the IPA Student Forum for this year. Like all Goans, I also have music running in my veins. So I play the keyboard, the guitar. I'm a singer, along with a passion for public speaking and a keen interest in painting. I'm also a sports enthusiast and an athlete. So before we move forward, I'd like to get uh, some housekeeping rules out of the way. So I request all the participants to please keep your microphones muted. We do not want to disturb our speakers in any way during the session. If at all you have any questions, then at the end of each speaker session, please drop down your questions in the chat box. And if there is time, we definitely will get back to your questions. Um, today, as I already mentioned, we will be having three lectures and each will be around 35 to 40 minutes. Towards the end of the three lectures, and this is very important, um, we will be posting a feedback link in the chat box. You'll have to fill the feedback form, only after which you all will be receiving your uh, certificates. If at all you, have, you aren't a member of the IPA, please, uh, you can do so um, using this link. Next. Okay, so this particular slide gives us an overview of all the participants for today's webinar coming from various sectors in the pharmacy profession. We have 274 registrations today and a large majority of them are from community pharmacy, um, followed by those working in the pharma industry, hospital pharmacists, and so on. We thank you all for participating in such a large number. We are sorry we could not accommodate you all in the uh, CP of last Sunday because of limited capacity. Next. So here's a little background information of the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. Um, it was established in 1939, which was 83 years ago in Banaras Hindu University. It is the oldest premier association of pharmaceutical professionals in India. And the IPA operates in India through 20 state branches and more than 46 local branches. So the IPA community pharmacy division in particular 
is um, dedicated towards the development and advancement of community pharmacy with a goal to improve pharmacy services and pharmaceutical care in India as well as patient welfare. Next. So currently, uh, here are some of the activities that are in progress. We have the antimicrobial resistance campaign, lifestyle diseases campaign, pharmacy practice research, training modules for pharmacists, mentoring pharmacy students, and conducting webinars and CPs like this particular one. Okay, so the Goa State Pharmacy Council has been conducting such CPE programs for the past few years, which have been really interesting and helpful. And it has definitely contributed to the professional development of all our registered pharmacists. We are motivated more than ever to carry on with such events, thanks to the overwhelming response we receive from you all. Like pretty much everything else that has been shifted to the online platform, thanks to COVID-19, we also had to conduct this CPE online. Here are some inputs from the Goa State Pharmacy Council. So, so far, the total number of pharmacists registered in the state is 4,513, of which Diploma in Pharmacy, um, we have 1,988, B Farm 2,506, and we have only nine PharmD um, pharmacists who have registered with us. As you all know, the State Pharmacy Council office is at the entrance of the FDA building in Bambulim, and the office the, uh, staff there handling is Mr. Omkar, and the registrar is Mrs. Mangala Kadam. So as per the Pharmacy Practice Regulations 2015, which were framed by the PCI, it is mandatory to attend at least two days of CP over a period of five years in order to renew your pharmacist registration with the council. We would like to extend a special thank you to Mr. Mahendra Naik for all the hard work and extra efforts in the registration as well as in coordinating with all our participants. Thank you, sir. So um, we are seeking volunteers from amongst you who would be interested in working with us to strengthen our hands and assist us in various activities that we undertake. Um, for more updates, you all can follow the media handles mentioned here of the IPA's Community Pharmacy Division. Next. All right. So I now take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker for the day, Mr. Uh, Dr. Amit Dias. Doctor is a member of the Indian Medical Association. He completed his MBBS in 1999 and MD in Preventive and Social Medicine at Goa Medical College, where he has been teaching for the last two decades. He was awarded the Kaitano Dias Fellowship to complete his postgraduate dipl diploma in geriatric medicine at the MS Ramya Medical College in Bangalore. He also completed his diploma in tropical medicine and the MSc in clinical trials from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, UK. He has several research papers in national and international scientific journals and has written chapters in several books. His work in the area of Alzheimer's disease has been recognized internationally and he has recently co-authored the Lancet paper on prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. He is the only Indian to have won the prestigious Foundation Medrick Alzheimer and Alzheimer Disease International Prize for being the best evidence-based psychosocial research for people with dementia. Under his leadership, Sangat, which is an internationally acclaimed NGO dedicated to the cause of bridging the treatment gap for mental health across the AIDS spectrum, won the prestigious Public Health Champions title in 2016 from the WHO the NGO Leadership Award and the RDX Adash Goinkar Award in 2017. He is the Founder Secretary of the Dementia Society of Goa and a member of the International Consortium for Prevention of Depression. He is a recipient of several fellowships and awards. He has also conducted a number of operational research projects on COVID-19 and its impact on the people. Um, 
Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Shivlin. That was a, that was a very long uh, introduction. Um, but uh, what I want to tell everyone is that I have been working in the area of dementia. And uh, I want to keep this presentation very simple. If you have a very long introduction for a speaker, you may think that it's going to be very complex. Uh, the idea is that you need to understand what I'm talking about. Once again, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me, the registrar, Mangal, Mrs. Mangala Kadam, uh, Mr. Raj Vaidya, uh, and uh, the whole team have been very supportive. And uh, all of you here, uh, sometimes you may just be wondering, what is this topic all about? Dementia, role of pharmacists, because what has the pharmacist got to do with, with Alzheimer's disease or dementia? And uh, sometimes one of you may just say, it's very easy. You just, you have a prescription written by a doctor and the role of a pharmacist would be to give these medications to them. But you need to understand in this presentation, I'm trying to highlight certain important role that the pharmacist could be playing in the area of dementia and dementia care. And uh, this is kind of my prescription for you for, for the day, uh, where we always, when we're talking to doctors, we talk in terms of a doctor-patient relationship. Similarly, when we talk to pharmacists, there is a pharmacist-patient relationship, which you need to understand. When we talk to doctors, again, we talk that you need to go beyond your clinic to be able to address um, community care, to be able to address the problems, health problems in the community. Similarly to the pharmacist, we need to say that you need to go beyond your pharmacy to be able to address the problem. And there is a lot of, there's a big role that a pharmacist can play in, in dementia care. Uh, one, you can just try to, you can understand how to recognize dementia. For that, you need to understand what is dementia and what really is happening to the person with dementia, what can happen and, and how can you address these issues. You need to understand dementia in detail. You need to understand a little bit about dementia care because that's that will help you in giving the advice to the patient or counseling the patient, which is an important role that the pharmacist has to play. You can understand prevention of dementia and uh, and the role that a pharmacy, pharmacist can play in what we call a dementia-friendly community. So a lot of people play a role in trying to ensure that this community is friendly for a person with dementia. And a pharmacist plays an important role there. How can a pharmacist play a role in, in forming a dementia-friendly community? That is what the talk is all about. But for those of you who may be a little lost about what dementia is and what I'm talking about, so you kind of understand the brain and you understand that there are different parts of the brain that have different functions. Now, in the temporal lobe, you have the auditory processing function or the, or the area that processes language comprehension. It is also an area that deals with memory and information retrieval. This is the part that is that is part of that is seen in dark green in this in this uh, brain. Uh, and it's important to understand this is the part of the brain that primarily gets affected in this disease condition. So how it gets affected, what really happens and why a person behaves the way the person behaves is what we'll try to understand. Okay, it, it's not that the disease just came up uh, recently, but this is something that happened 100 years ago or, or a little more than that, wherein a patient came to this doctor and uh, the doctor asked that patient, what's your name? And she said, my name is Agushta. My name is Agushta Dieter. And what's your last name? She said, um, Agushta. And what's your husband's name? Agushta. You know, she, she couldn't remember her own name. She couldn't remember her full name. She couldn't remember her husband. She was old and she had memory problems. Uh, nothing much really happened. He gave treatment for this patient. The patient died in 1906 and um, she donated her brain to this doctor to study. And uh, he found under the microscope, there was something abnormal inside the brain. There were these ab abnormal amyloid plaques, abnormal proteins inside the brain. And he then came up with the hypothesis that probably these abnormal protein particles inside the brain, which are called amyloid plaques, could be responsible for the cause of this memory problems in this and uh, the name of the doctor was Alloy Alzheimer. He was a German neuropathologist and today we name that disease Alzheimer's disease after him. Even today we still feel that amyloid plaques is one of the important um, mechanisms by which Alzheimer's disease occurs in, in the brain. But we need to understand what really other things are happening as well. So amyloid plaques is one of the the hypothesis that we have or mechanisms by which this disease occurs. We also know something called tau tangles. So in our, in our neurons, we have, uh, you know, uh, neurofibrillary tangles can take place. So there are tau particles that keep these microtubules together. It's like uh, you are watering your garden with the help of a pipe and suddenly that pipe gets kinked. 
And what happens? The water does not come out from the other end. So you have to undo that kink in the pipe in order to get let the water go through. So similar thing happens inside the neurotubules, inside the neurons, wherein the tau particles keep them all in place. When the tau particles becomes abnormal, then they tend to twist and there are neurofibrillary tangles, as a result of which the neurochemical messages that take place, they do not go through these neurons and uh, new memories cannot form. We also have another theory called the acetylcholine theory. So in our brain, there are different uh, neurotransmitters. There are neurotransmitters uh, like dopamine, there's acetylcholine. Now in uh, in a synapse, there is a need for a message to go from one neuron to the other. And the neurotransmitter does this job of taking the message from one place to the other. This neurotransmitter decreases as we grow old, but in Alzheimer's disease decreases as much as 90%. So therefore, your message reaches at one point, but doesn't go from one neuron to the other neuron, as a result of which newer messages or new memories cannot be formed. Okay, so there are various theories. I'm just telling you the theories because people do not behave abnormally because they want to behave abnormally. They behave in a manner that they behave because they cannot do, they cannot remember. And if you understand this, you'll be able to understand how to take care of a person with dementia. I have a short film to explain this. It will help you understand this a little better. Let's see if you can hear this film. You'll get to know what's happening inside the brain of a person. You hear the sound? In healthy people, all sensations, movements, yes. thoughts, memories, and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid clumps into plaques, which slowly build up between neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches a tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. The brain may lack the glucose needed to power its activity. Chronic inflammation sets in as microglial cells fail to clear away debris and astrocytes react to distressed microglia. Eventually, neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks, beginning in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think, remember, make decisions, and function independently. Achieving a deeper understanding. Yeah, so just to summarize what, what, what is there, you can see in this picture, uh, this is uh, half of it is a normal brain and half is a brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease. You can see the normal brain is nice and fleshy, uh, but the part of the brain that is a brain of the a person with Alzheimer's disease has bigger spaces. So the ventricles are bigger. The parts that deal with language, the parts that deal with memory have more holes, so they're more spongy. Uh, and so they don't function. So you have problems in language, you have problems in memory. It's not only memory, there are a, comp the number of other factors that get affected, the ability to think, the ability to take decisions. And this is why a person Will, um, will present the way the person will present in a, in a person with, with Alzheimer's disease. And this is 
primarily uh, in a person who's growing old and also it's it's neurodegenerative and it's progressive so as the years progress the disease keeps getting worse now some of you will will say okay forgetfulness so that happens to us as well so are we getting dementia are we supposed to be worried about it so when does forgetfulness become a disease this is a question that a lot of people ask so sometimes when you're writing the date, for example, even now I see sometimes people write that instead of writing 21, 2021, they write, uh, they instead of writing 22, they write 21. So, you know, this kind of lapses can take place. Uh, but if you ask a person Alzheimer's disease, if a person, or if a person tells you that, you know, what's the year and he says it is uh, 2005 and uh, says, okay, is it really 2005? Ah, no, no, I think it's the next year has changed. Huh? So it must be 2006. So if they say something like that, then that you, you can see that that is a problem. Uh, we can forget where we put things. We can forget where we keep our pen or we keep a mobile. But once you find a pen and you don't know what it is uh, or what is used for, so that could be a, a sign of disease. So it's not only forgetfulness. When forgetfulness affects your day-to-day -day activity, when forgetfulness becomes progressive, when, when you, you, know, you lose things, but you just can't find them anymore, and you repeatedly lose these things. And so that could be a sign of a disease and a person uh, who is growing old and has these memory lapses, one needs, who's getting progressively confused, who's having memory problems, who finds it difficult uh, thinking, uh, gets lost in, in a familiar environment. You need to consider uh, the diagnosis of dementia and get the person to a physician who can make that kind of a diagnosis. So where does a pharmacist play a role? And this is an important bit that you all need to understand because I, I told you this is the condition that affects older people and older people have multiple comorbid conditions and therefore they would be coming to the pharmacist on a regular basis to collect some medication. So if you have a person who's asking you the same question repeatedly, you know, when, when should I take these medications? How many times should I take the, these medications? Um, you know, should I take it before food or after food? And they've asked you, you have told them and they come back and ask you the same thing immediately. So you kind of can sense memory problems in, in, in these people. If you see people who are not coming to take their medication sometimes, forgetting to take their medications, they or who have taken the medication and come again in 15 days to come to, to collect the medications again. So this is usually happening in, in you know, uh, small hospitals or primary health centers where people come once in two months or once in a month to collect the medication. And this person comes more frequently and says, no, no, I had come one month ago. So my medicines are over. Uh, and so you can probably sense that something could be going wrong over here. Very often, sometimes we also have this bad habit of in hospitals, smaller hospitals or PHC, sometimes we have these uh, case files, which is a good thing to keep, case files. But uh, the medications are only written inside the case file. And uh, the pharmacist will then give the drugs to the patient and not give them the prescription. So they don't know how to take those medications. And older people can get confused. So the doctor and the pharmacist need to make sure that the person does have some kind of a schedule wherein they know how these medications could be taken into, should be taken. So memory loss is the primary sign, but and it's usually recent memory loss. So they will forget things that they just did. They had breakfast and they will forget that they taken breakfast. Uh, but if you ask them things of the past, they will they will know that quite well. So this memory loss then progressively worsens. So then it will go on. Say first you will forget the names of your grandchildren. Then you'll forget. Uh, how many grandchildren you have and uh, then you'll forget the names of your children and whether they are married etc then you'll forget about your own self your family whether you are married or not so this is how the disease keeps on progressing and memory keeps on getting worse difficulty performing familiar tasks things that they were always doing now they will find it difficult to do because of this condition and there's a fact that they cannot remember uh, problems with language. So they will probably start something, you know, very often we, we also may forget some, if I wanted to explain something to you, like say, I wanted to tell you about the synapse or a neurotransmitter acetylcholine, I might just forget that word acetylcholine. It can happen and can come to me later on. Uh, but a person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia will forget, you know, midway through a sentence, will forget what the person was trying to say. And then the second part of the sentence could be something totally different or make a new sentence altogether. So this is the problem that a person has. Very often, a language that they have learned more recently is forgotten. So something that learned in the past. So if you speak to a lot of Goans who have studied in Portuguese and are speaking Portuguese before, if you speak to them in Portuguese, they'll be able to um, talk to you much better than if you speak to them in English, uh, which is a language that they've learned much more recently. They could be disoriented in time and place. In their own house, they can get disoriented. Whilst going to the toilet, they may forget where the toilet is and go to another room and 
and use it as a toilet. And that's where the problems arise. Uh, there is a poor or decreased judgment, problems keeping track of things, like if they pay the bills, etc., which they were doing all this while, but now they're not paying the bills and they've forgotten whether they paid the bill or they want to go to pay the bill again. Misplacing things, change in mood and behavior, trouble uh, with images and spatial relationship, and withdrawal from work and social activity. Somebody was very positive, was meeting people, liked to meet people. Now when there is a visitor who's come to the house, they will go and hide inside. So if these kind of signs are seen, then you need to be aware that this could be signs of dementia and the need to go to a physician who can make a diagnosis. Now, what complicates the whole issue is that dementia is not just one condition. You know, I've used the term Alzheimer's disease sometimes and dementia sometimes. So dementia is this umbrella term, uh, which includes all diseases where people tend to forget. So all these conditions where people tend to forget, they're all various kinds of neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, and Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common form of dementia. Around 60 to 80% of the dementias are because of Alzheimer's disease. Even in India, we have around 60% of, of dementias are due to Alzheimer's disease. Many doctors feel otherwise. But uh, if you do a study in the community, we see that a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease are there, but they have not been diagnosed. In fact, when I was doing a study in the community, I found out that almost 90% of the families of person with dementia didn't know that the person had that uh, diagnosis. So they were living with a person who was forgetting. They were worried about why the person was forgetting. In fact, even 55% of them had gone to a doctor, but the doctor had not given them the diagnosis of dementia. So dementia is being kind of neglected or not diagnosed even by the primary physician. Dementia is not understood by the community at large, as a result of which 90% of them were didn't know that they had that condition and therefore they were trying to deal with it on their own. So the first step to care is making a diagnosis and a pharmacist can play an important role in recognizing the early signs of dementia. So besides Alzheimer's disease, there's dementia with Wee body where a person may present with Parkinson's like symptoms. You are seen in the video, vascular dementia is another form of dementia. In fact, in a country like India, around 20% of dementias or even more could be vascular dementia. We see a lot of people with mixed form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease and vascular form of dementia. So vascular dementia is like a stroke, like a mini stroke. You have multiple infarcts that take place and they destroy the part of the brain that deal with memory as a result of which they cannot remember. So the progression of these vascular dementias is like you'll, you'll forget then suddenly you'll have another small stroke and then your, your memory will, will drop and it'll be a step ladder type and then another stroke. So you need to give medications to prevent another stroke in, in these people. It's the same kind of a stroke prevention type of strategy would help in vascular dementia. Then there is frontotemporal dementias which occur in earlier age and the people will kind of change the whole personality um, because it's the frontal lobe that is uh, being damaged in frontotemporal dementias. You can get frontotemporal dementia at the age of say 45 or so. Usually dementia is about the age of 60, but there are certain forms of dementias that you can get earlier on, which can be very uh, uh, problematic to the whole family. Now, those were irreversible form of dementia. There is treatment available, but there is no cure for these forms of dementia. There are some forms of dementia, and that is another reason why you need to go to a doctor early, which are reversible causes. And so drugs can cause dementia, for example, benzodiazepine, et cetera, can cause dementia. Uh, emotional problems, the person has depression. Uh, depression, there is a condition called depressive pseudo-dementia. So because of depression, you may, end, uh, you may tend to forget. There could be metabolic conditions causing dementia, like if somebody has renal failure uh, and you know hyponatremia can cause uh, dementia. Endocrine problems like thyroid problems can cause dementia. If somebody has hypothyroidism, that also can cause dementia. There are nutritional problems that can cause, cause dementia. Normal pressure, hydrocephalus. Again, investigations, the scan of the brain, et cetera, will be able to reveal these uh, conditions and we'll be able to treat uh, if, if detected early. Nutritional problems like B12 deficiency, B1 deficiency can cause dementia. Tumors or trauma to the brain can cause dementia. Infections can cause dementia. So if somebody has some uh, tubocloma, for example, in the brain, uh, it can cause dementia. Alcohol can cause dementia. Autoimmune conditions can cause dementia. So if you see this mnemonic of your dementia, uh, it it uh, it helps us remember the reversible forms of dementia. So therefore, the point I'm making, it's important to detect dementia early. Pharmacists are in very close contact with older people. And so you can, by building this pharmacy, pharmacist-patient relationship, you can be in a position to be able to sense the signs of, of dementia. If, if either that person comes to you and, and, and complains about it, 
or you notice certain behavioral changes in that individual or maybe a caregiver the person who's come with the person complains and kashi sasa sadan sashi karta kide karta and then they tell you a little more about that and they say there is a problem of forgetfulness and then you can say okay yes so this could be a sign of dementia let us let us get her evaluated so uh, that's how you can play a very very important role not only one in in uh, the detection but also in the post um, diagnostic support so what can happen to a person beyond dementia and you see in covid 19 the older population is somebody who has really been affected by this condition by various ways one is because covid 19 itself was affecting older people and was most severe in in the aged population uh, especially those with comorbidities and older people are more likely to have these comorbidities at the same time the measures that we took for managing or or trying to prevent covid 19 like uh, social isolation etc had a direct impact on older people in worsening the condition like depression and dementia in them the role of the pharmacist remember if if you remember this one golden principle you would be able to deal with the person with dementia so understand that you're dealing with a person and not dealing with a disease so if you understand the person behind this condition uh, you will be able to deal with the person with dementia much better so speak to them softly speak to make maintain eye contact if the person is asking you something again spend some time with that person to explain that i don't say you know kitle party to ka sangpa ka maka time na you know so try to see if you can make time for that person there are not going to be too many people with dementia in your in your pharmacy so you know this is going to be a few of them uh, and uh, you can take some time to explain things to them much better remember for drugs and older people it's always important to one do an assessment of the medications and do an assessment of the patient again very often because with with age they go to they've gone to multiple doctors they've collected medicines from various doctors and they they have a whole big bag of these medicines and they feel that that doctors this medicine is useful you need to evaluate what medications they're taking very often they're taking the same medication different brand names so you need to evaluate this no doubt about it always address the findings prefer simplification as far as medications are concerned prefer less toxic drugs and with uh, those with lower risk are the ones that you need to prefer even with people on treatment with dementia you need to keep in mind that uh, uh, there is a point where we should decide that this medication is not useful and so the doctor should take a call on this with the help of the patient and the family member uh, to decide that we don't continue with these medications it's not necessary to take it lifelong when you see that it is not showing any effect uh, we have to be careful many of the medications that are taking in the drug reactions there is there are a lot of side effects so you need to keep these things in mind when you're dealing with them instead of giving some other medications to deal with the side effect of the medication so ask yourself always is this drug really necessary for the person and if it is necessary then only go ahead with it avoid too many medications in older people remember another important factor as far as medications is concerned is that this older person however much they may say that i can remember everything don't worry i'm they 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 get a waqta geta ti ha ti bari asa tashi ti bari shani ta asa then you know somebody may tell you that but remember they having a memory problem and so they may not be able to take the medications regularly they may take a, a tablet and forget that they take it and may take another one so these kind of problems are known to occur in in a person dementia don't wait for the problem to occur uh, instead you help the person deal with how to take the medication and keep a significant other person who will be able to deal with the medicines for these people with dementia so keep that in mind very often a person with dementia may not have insight into the condition so they may say everything is fine they may say i'm taking my medications regularly they, they they will actually feel that they're taking medications regularly but they may not be doing it so one has to be very careful about these conditions as far as medications for dementia is concerned or alzheimer's disease is concerned we do have anticholinesterase i told you acetylcholine is required uh, is a neurotransmitter required at the synapse and which decreases so what they do is there is a uh, enzyme that destroys acetylcholine uh, which is cholinesterase so they give anticholinesterase they give anticholinesterase so that enzyme that destroys acetylcholine is decreased as a result of which which will whatever little acetylcholine is there will act and the memories will the messages will go from one synapse to from one uh, neuron to the other through the synapse so this could be there so donepezil galantamine rivastigmine are, are, are drugs like these and we also have nemda um, uh, uh, blockers which is uh, memantine is another drug that can be used for people with dementia now a important fact uh, important way of dealing with people with dementia is communication so how you 
talk to a person, uh, try to distract, uh, diminish distraction as much as possible when you're talking to them. So when you're talking to them, it's going to be a very noisy environment. They may be distracted, they may be hearing something else and not listening to you. So you need to make sure that the place is nice and quiet. You need to be maintaining eye contact with the person. You might as well touch the person and, you know, there is some kind of touch. So the person is, you, you can make sure that the person is uh, talking to you. Don't look somewhere else and talk to the person uh, because the person may not be able to understand what you're saying. Verbal communication as well as non-verbal communication is kind of important for that person. Converse one-to-one. -one, so more people equals to more confusion. Keep things simple. Stick to very short and specific uh, statements. Avoid arguments with, with people with dementia. So sometimes, you know, they'll say, uh, you never gave me breakfast. And then you would want to argue, oh, yes, you have taken breakfast. Here's the cup. This is your cup. This is an empty cup. Who has kept this cup? This is, this is not even washed. So it must be yours. So you try to argue with them and it doesn't really help. They have totally, it's, it's gone off their head that they had that breakfast. So uh, try a different way of, of dealing with this. You can either distract them or maybe give them a small amount uh, to eat again. So, you know, which is also, uh, you know, a way forward. So find a way out of how you can deal with them. Uh, remember different people with dementia are different and different strategies that we use in people, you know, one strategy may work on somebody, but the same thing may not work in another person. So you may have to tweak it a bit, but you need to understand one thing that you're dealing with a person. And when you understand that you're dealing with a person, you'll be able to come up with these strategies. Uh, just keep talking to the person, even if the person is not responding. So you may think the person is not listening to you, but they are processing certain things and they are building a relationship with you, which is an important relationship, the caregiver and the person with dementia relationship, which helps um, build this further. Okay, so as I said before, dementia is not only memory problems, but it's memory problems to an extent that it affects your day-to-day -day activity. So you can't do your day-to-day -day activity. This I mean, actually and in Marathi, Smriti branch. Okay, this condition that I'm talking about in Marathi, there is this term Smriti branch that you know comes close to that. Uh, and in uh, Konkani, there is no really a, a term for dementia, but Visal Bali is one of the terminologies that we use. Uh, we can help people with groom grooming, we can help people with dressing, we can help people who have an eating problem, toileting problem, sleep problem, bathing problem, uh, taking medications, etc. And uh, this is exactly what we try to deal, um, uh, develop when we formed the Dementia Society of Goa. We would, um, you know, it was my thesis topic to study the care arrangements for people with dementia. And I found that a lot of people are living with dementia and they need help. The family members needed help. The caregivers were quite distressed about the whole condition. Some of them were suicidal. Some of them, the caregivers I'm talking about, they were depressed and they needed help. So we really, the way, um, I developed the program is to first address the issues of the caregiver. So you need to make sure that the caregiver is not depressed and not having this burnout. Once they come out of this, once they come to terms with this condition, once they understand that, you know, this is a disease that is causing the problem in this person, they tend to deal with the person. There's a totally different relationship between the person with dementia and the caregiver and it can improve things a, a lot a lot more. We also learned from the mistakes a lot of people have done in the past and we've learned from literature and we put that whole package together to help families deal with people with dementia. Sometimes it's not rocket science. For example, if a person with dementia is wandering and running out of the house and getting lost, then the simple thing to do is to put a lock on the gate so, so that person doesn't walk out of the place. So if there is a sleep problem, sleep hygiene, toilet problem, there are ways of dealing with that. Feeding problems, there are ways of dealing with that. Clothing, anger, etc. There are techniques by which we can deal with that. And so we train caregivers to deal with the person with dementia. And this was the outreach program. The reason why I'm telling you this is because just as I did this outreach program, you can also think of doing some kind of outreach programs in the community where you address the issues of, the, of people with dementia by doing these outreaches. The first part of the outreach program was to give them a diagnosis. The second part of the outreach program was primarily non-pharmacological interventions and helping people with the activities of daily living and also addressing behavioral problems in people with dementia. If the person was getting angry, if the person was apathetic, uh, so if, if the person was getting agitated, was uh, wandering, so how you deal with these kind of behavioral problems was the whole big uh, intervention for these families. And we found that to be very, very useful. Uh, how big is the problem of dementia in the world? Every three seconds, we get one new person with dementia. So this is how big it is. Um, currently, there are 50 million people with dementia living uh, around the world. 
and these numbers are expected to rise to 132 million by 2050. In India alone, we have around 4 million people with dementia. In Goa, we'll be having around 5,000 people with dementia. And as life expectancy is increasing, the problems of older people are also increasing. So people are living longer. So diseases that affect older people, primarily like Parkinson's disease, stroke, dementia, are also on the rise and we need to do something about that. What we also see from this slide is the low and middle income countries, countries like China and India, the number of cases of dementia are rising or going to rise much faster. The WHO has said that dementia is a major public health problem and we need to do something about this. And a question, I just put this slide, um, is can we prevent dementia? This is the work that we did through the Lancet mission uh, to look at all the literature that was there around the world on what can prevent dementia. And here's the good news. The good news is that around 40% of the people with dementia or the cases of dementia can either be, we can postpone them or we can prevent them by addressing 12 risk factors. One, we need to increase education. Two, we need to increase physical activity. We need to increase social contact. We need to decrease hearing loss. I, I showed you that the problems of memory take place somewhere in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe deals with hearing and also deals with memory. So we have seen, and hearing is also one of the important stimuli for us. So if somebody has a hearing problem, and this happens in older people, uh, and you don't address the hearing problem, then the memory loss progresses much faster. So it's important to address hearing loss much earlier on. Things that are good for the heart are good for the brain. So things like hypertension, obesity, smoking, uh, uh, diabetes have to be addressed such that we can not only protect the heart, but can also protect the brain. Uh, excessive alcohol intake can cause problem, head injury, and air pollution was also seen to cause a problem of, of dementia. So these are the various factors that we need to kind of address if we want to prevent dementia. Again, I'm, I'm repeating what is good for the heart is good for the brain. So exercise, decrease your cholesterol, have more good cholesterol, bad cholesterol to be decreased. Your diet should contain a mix of food. A balanced diet is what we advise. Um, you know, naturally colored food in your diet, around five colored items, which um, increases the antioxidants are uh, kind of good for you. Uh, we have this concept of use it or lose it. So if you don't use your brain, then you tend to lose those cells and the cells tend to die. So you keep your brain active by doing things that you like doing. You can also learn a new language. You can learn new musical instrument if you want. Uh, you know, music and dance are one of the, you know, dance is also physical activity. In fact, this year, for or last year rather, for Alzheimer's Day, we introduced something called Move to Prevent Dementia. We tried to educate people about some dance steps, learn new dance steps and do this physical activity and post it on social media. So that was a very exciting thing that people did. So crosswords, if you like, Sudoku, but even having social gatherings and meetings uh, will help. And we have started something called a memory cafe in, um, this was pre-COVID time where we started in, in, in Panjim. And a lot of seniors would come for the memory cafe. We used to have it every Monday and, and Wednesday. And uh, now we have it on Zoom. So this is a, a picture that we I, I, I we clicked on uh, on the tenth, where you know just soon after the first talk that I had given, we had a a memory cafe on Zoom, and this was with the carnival theme. And you can see uh, all our senior citizens who are very enthusiastically participating in this. They come up with some creative ideas and creative things, and they uh, we we get together. We use a lot of music and dance. So you know when Evelyn was saying that she was good with guitar and keyboards, etc. So this is the kind of thing that we, we do at the Memory Cafe. So any of you want to volunteer to help out and assist them, you can take one day and you can uh, come up with various kinds of cognitive exercises. So we, we, we use song, but we help them, uh, we, we step it up by trying to get them to remember the lyrics of the song without reading them. So they have to remember that. So that's how they use the memory. Active aging is something that has to be focused on, not at the age of 60 or 70, but much earlier on, they have to do activity. We need to focus on what is good for the heart, is good for the brain. So look after your heart, be physically active, follow a healthy diet, enjoy social activity and challenge the brain. Uh, I've also started something called the Mind It, Mind it Initiative. Mind It is about minding the mind. And so in order to ensure that Children adopt a brain healthy activity. We have these brain healthy exercises and education program in schools, which is working quite well. I do it, uh, you know, every year. I used to do it for classes um, eight and ninth before, but now even smaller children, I've, I've, I've realized that they also pick these things up quite well. So it's, it's designed for smaller children as well. And um, it works two ways. One, it helps them 
adopt a healthy activity, a brain activity, brain uh, lifestyle. And at the same time, if they have a grandmother or grandfather in the house who have, have dementia, they're kind of sensitive to that. And they can tell their parents that this is a sign of a disease. So why don't you just take grandma or grandpa to a doctor who can make a diagnosis? So it helps in that uh, awareness building as well, because a lot of children, uh, you know, a lot of families have children going to school. So in this way, we can reach out to all the families. We also involve our medical students in various activities on Alzheimer's Day. You know, 21st September is World Alzheimer's Day. So we had a lot of activities there. In fact, 25th September, if I'm not mistaken, is pharmacy day. So you can have some activities there as well. Um, and uh, like Amol, who's speaking next, will be talking about World Kidney Day and uh, the activities that he had. He just had a, a cycle con today and he's, uh, he's there to speak to you now in the afternoon. Um, we had a lot, we tried to involve the community at, at large, and we also try to build uh, what we call a dementia-friendly community, and a pharmacist plays an important role in building this dementia-friendly community. Just a one-minute short video of this works uh, on this before I wind up my talk. Today we are visiting the pharmacy. Individuals living with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia may face these challenges confusion about prescriptions and how they should be taken, problems communicating, difficulty paying. Here's what you can do. Remain calm and reassuring and maintain eye contact. Speak slowly using short, simple sentences and be patient when reviewing prescriptions. Suggest and offer to fill a daily pill sorter to help manage prescriptions. Ask if he or she would like you to call a relative, close friend, or care provider if that information is available. If you work at a pharmacy, be a dementia friend. Yeah, so that's what I want to tell you. To be a dementia friend, be very friendly to people with dementia, be sensitive to the cause of dementia, and uh, be sensitive to the diagnosis of dementia. If you have an older person who's having confusion and memory problem, keep in mind that this could be a sign of dementia. So with that, I would wind my uh, talk. If there are any questions, I'm most happy to take them. But uh, don't go away because there's a very exciting talk coming by Dr. Amol Malda next and then by Dr. Poonam, uh, brilliant students and also students who, I mean, now no longer my students, but then I've also have dealt with, have had dealing with a lot of social causes in a big way. So it will be, um, uh, you know, a treat for you to listen to them. So any questions from anybody, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, sir, for such an engaging session. I personally learned a lot, and the fact that dementia can be slowed and prevented uh, piqued my interest in particular because Alzheimer's, um, uh, there's a history of Alzheimer's in my family. So thank you, sir. Uh, requesting the participants, if you'll have any questions, please drop it down in the chat box. Good, no questions. I hope I've not confused you too much. Yeah, there is one. So there's a question. Uh, if an elderly person forgets things and then repeats the same topic spoken, the yeah, question so is, is that a sign of dementia? No, is okay. that a sign of dementia is the saying, yes. Okay, so there are a lot of questions coming. So is that a sign of dementia if a person forgets something and repeats the same topic again and again? Yes, that could be a sign of dementia if it, if it, the person is repeating the same thing again and again and completely forgets the, that they've asked these questions before. So what, it, what, I've, what I've realized is it's important. It's, it, it's better to be more uh, sensitive to that and get the person examined by someone who can make sense of that. So keep in mind the diagnosis of dementia in this, this, in this individual. Is Parkinson's related to dementia? There are forms of dementia that have Parkinson's like features, a masked face, difficulty in walking, et cetera. But um, yeah, and uh, there is a Parkinson's related dementia, but Parkinson's is by itself another disease. Okay, so Lewy body dementia, that I said, uh, mentioned before, these, these people tend to have Parkinson's like symptoms as well. But Parkinson's by itself is a separate disease and not necessarily that a person with Parkinson's will have dementia. There the neurotransmitter is dopamine and over here the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. 
if somebody has schizophrenia taking treatment for a very long can that person have alzheimer's disease now not uh, there is no direct connection there but if a person has schizophrenia as a result of which there is some kind of a, you know the brain is not being stimulated too much uh, then that could predispose a person to develop dementia so you know you need to look in in, in on those lines uh, but primarily if a person has memory problems after having schizophrenia it could be the schizophrenia itself that is causing the problem in that person please put some light on prevention of dementia i had spoken about those 12 points that can actually prevent dementia so it's also important to understand when we try to prevent dementia so it's trying to do this kind of it's never too late to bring about lifestyle changes for dementia prevention but earlier on the earlier you do these lifestyle changes the better it is because all these this like atherosclerosis for your heart you know th these changes take place much earlier on maybe at the age of 40 or 50 it is it started to take place uh, and if you put in these behavior changes much earlier on you can slow the process of dementia so if somebody instead of somebody getting dementia at the age of 65 will get the get dementia at the age of 85 so that is giving you a lot of good quality life um, and so you know eating healthy exercising exercise don't underestimate the importance of exercise so exercise is very important uh, don't understate and estimate the importance of weight reduction um, that is also important uh, and uh, the importance of antioxidants besides that in diet not things like turmeric are seen to be useful green tea you know then it, it tends to be useful but not just one cup will not help you need to have at least around five to six cups to be able to get the effect of something like this so i'm not saying going for these expensive uh, uh, interventions something simple in your diet also can help patient with diabetes history has a chance to dementia yes dementia predisposes a person uh, sorry diabetes does predispose a person to dementia so control of diabetes no undoubtedly is an important strategy for prevention of dementia for prevention of heart disease uh, I've come across many who tell people uh, that they handcuff tie old suffering people to dementia the beds in the country. Yes, how do we encounter? How do we counter that? A lot of people do. You know, and when I was going house to house, I used to see this problem. They would keep people with dementia on a newspaper in the back side of the house because they, they would mess up the place, keep them locked up in some room. Some people would keep them locked up outside the house, and some people would put some chains and keep them tied up. And this is happening in Goa. And uh, but when we explain to them the techniques by which you can deal with a person with dementia, things change quite a bit. And um, there are certain ways by which you can lower the behavioral problems. There are some medications that can be given to these people with dementia as well to lower the behavioral problems. If that can be done. Uh, and if you understand that person-centered care, if you understand that it's a person uh, behind this disease, then you will not lock them up and handcuff them. You know, handcuffing them and locking them up is actually... Uh, abuse of a person with dementia but uh, they do it out of frustration sometimes and they need to know how to deal with that and that's where the training comes in that's where you know you we have very few experts in dementia we have very few neurologists and psychiatrists so what i what we realize is the other people who are working in the community which could be a pharmacist could be a community health worker could be a community doctor a community physician who can actually address these problems but they need to be educated themselves and starts with education programs like these yeah. Yeah. Any other question? There is bypass surgery for a person aged seventy-six years. Can it trigger dementia? Um, if a person has a heart problem, that means a person could have the risk factors for dementia, and so that itself could have been there could be an underlying dementia in there. We have seen sometimes people who come out of anesthesia, and sometimes they tend to have. Uh, uh, dementia-like symptoms after that and so it's not that it's triggered off probably it's recognized after a major incident like that that could be the way that's how i would look at it yeah i think we'll go to the next speaker where samol is waiting thank you all for your yeah wonderful comments over to you evelyn thank you sir yeah. Um, now let's move on to our second speaker for the day. Could you please put the slide? Harj? All right, so our second speaker is Dr. Amol Mahaldar. 
Uh, doctor is an alumnus of Goa Medical College, completing MBBS in 2000 and MD Medicine in 2004. He pursued DNB in Nephrology in Minakshi Mission Hospital and Research Center, Madurai, completing the same in 2010. Doctor is an ISPD scholar and underwent fellowship training at Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow in 2010. Having returned to Goa in 2010, he was instrumental in setting up the first kidney transplant unit at Goa Medical College in 2011. Presently, he is working with leading hospitals in Goa, including Manipal Hospital. He has a passion for preventive nephrology and clinical research. He has over a dozen publications in journals of reputed, in reputed journals and has presented several award-winning research papers in national and international conferences. Dr. Mahaldar is among very few Indian doctors to complete the postgraduate diploma in transplant procurement and management at University of Barcelona in 2017. Over to you, Dr. Amol. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thanks for that brief introduction. Uh, let me keep my talk as well uh, very brief and succinct. So the talk is about World Kidney Day. Uh, can I move to full screen, please? Yes. You can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the topic is Bridge the Gap in Kidney Care. Okay. The World Kidney Day is celebrated on the second Thursday of every March. This year, it's coming on the 10th of March, which is also the results of uh, Goa elections. And we are taking the opportunity of uh, this uh, CME here, uh, continuing pharmaceutical CP rather. I'm a doctor and I keep talking about CMEs. I have another CME after this. So we are talking about bridging the gap in knowledge about kidney disease. So the goal of such uh, campaigns is to increase the awareness of importance of kidneys to our health and also reduce the impact of kidney disease and problems associated with kidney disease across the world. Like I said, the theme for this year is bridge the knowledge gap. And there is a lot of uh, gap in the understanding of people uh, about kidney disease and its importance and how many people suffer from the problem. And that uh, makes it important for us to uh, take some preventive steps going forwards. So whom do we try and address in, the, in these talks? We just talk to everybody involved, from the general public to people who are affected by the disease healthcare professionals who care for such patients, health authorities and government that formulate uh, policies that affect these patients and generally care of kidney patients, and pharmacists, you people as well, because you people play a very vital role in the care of kidney patients. Why is it so important to talk about kidney disease? Uh, we can see in this slide here, which is a research publication that compares how much is the kidney burden in 2016 as compared to 2000. Uh, 1990s, so after a period of 25 years almost, the incidence of kidney disease has doubled. People now, uh, almost 1.2 million deaths are happening every year in 2016 because of kidney disease. It used to be 0.6 million in 1990s. And this is increasing more so in the developing world, especially India and China, which is seeing an epidemic of diabetes as well as increasing elderly population. Like Dr. Amit just spoke before uh, me, uh, there is increased prevalence of dementia in elderly population, but not just dementia, they have higher incidence of cancer, heart disease and kidney disease as well. But it's not just the elderly that suffer from kidney disease. We can assume that 10% of an adult population, that is one out of every 10 adults, have minor kidney ailments. This doesn't mean they have kidney failure. That would be too much too many numbers. So one in 10 people have a minor kidney ailment and millions die of complications of kidney disease. Sometimes they are not even dying of kidney problems. They might have heart ailments and other things, but the primary disease could be kidney issues. In our country, there are close to 2 lakh people every year who require dialysis, new ones. In Goa itself, which is a very small state, we see around 200 to 250 people every year new patients who require dialysis. That's almost like one patient every other day requiring dialysis somewhere in Goa. 
and we really cannot afford these many uh, people on dialysis because the treatment is quite expensive, is quite labor and consumable intensive. Uh, even if the patient is getting care from a government hospital or a public funded, after all, somebody is paying for it. The tax money is going into uh, caring for these patients. So the prudent thing would be to try and reduce the burden of kidney disease. And that's why these kind of awareness talks or public awareness talks are very important. Uh, kidneys function like your car. You know, uh, your car has the capacity to go from zero to 120 kilometers per hour. The kidney has the capacity to work at 125 ml per minute. That is the amount of blood that it filters every minute. So the heart can pump around five liters of blood every minute. 600 ml of that goes in the kidney and 125 ml of that gets filtered out. But 99% of this gets reabsorbed and only a percent gets uh, uh, you know, passed out as urine. In effect, almost 180 liters of uh, blood is being filtered and only two liters of urine is being made. So it's important that we drink a lot of water. It helps the filtration process. The main functions of the kidney is to maintain a balance in the body in terms of fluid, what we drink and what we make when we are digesting food and pass it out as urine. Along with this urine, it also puts out the waste metabolites in the body, the urea, the ammonia, and so many thousands of molecules. Not just a sewage treatment plant, it also works like a factory that produces certain hormones. The important hormones that the kidney produce is renin, which controls the blood pressure, erythropoietin, which actually tells the body that you need to make more hemoglobin, and vitamin D. Myriad of other hormones are also produced by the kidney, but for paucity of time, let us just think about these few ones that are very, very important for our living. If the kidneys get affected by any kind of damage that is there for more than three months, we call it as chronic kidney disease. And this then becomes an inexorable deterioration. That means it is going to slowly keep on getting worse. Once chronic kidney disease is diagnosed, most often it does not reverse. And that is the important thing. If you uh, read the slide, chronic kidney disease is currently not curable. There are no medicines that can reverse the kidney problems. But if it is detected early, we can slow down the progress of kidney failure and we can postpone the need for dialysis or a transplant. So let me repeat that. We cannot prevent dialysis or transplant in patients who have CKE, but we can postpone it. What could happen in a few months, we can put it away by a few years. What could happen in a few years, we could push by a few decades. So this is why we have to try and diagnose patients as early as possible in the course of their illness. Not just kidney ailments, kidney disease patients also have high incidence of heart ailments. So how do we recognize these patients that have kidney disease? Uh, unfortunately, the kidney patients come with symptoms quite late and 90% of the patients won't have symptoms till they have lost 90% of their function. The earliest symptoms would be something like swelling in the legs, swelling around the eyes, frequently getting up at night to pass urine, loss of appetite, blood pressure in very young people. So these would be the symptoms of kidney disease at an early stage. Um, who is at risk? You should consider somebody as a, is at risk of kidney failure if they suffer from high blood pressure, if they have diabetes, if there is a family history of kidney disease in that person, if they are obese, all elderly patients are at risk and certain areas of origin, certain races like the black amongst the Americans and certain parts of geographical locations of India. And even in Goa, we have one particular uh, taluka which has disproportionately higher risk of kidney disease. So can we prevent kidney disease? So today we had a beautiful cycle, right? If you go on Facebook, you could see the pictures. Uh, there are eight points that, you know, can be done to prevent kidney disease and at least keep your kidney health. The most important is keep fit and active. At least lead a healthy lifestyle where you do 40 minutes of exercise on a daily basis, at least seven times in a week. Keep control of your blood sugar, achieving a uh, target blood sugar. In young patients, it is near normal blood sugar, but in elderly people, at least below 140 and below 180 uh, postprandial. 140 fasting and 180 postprandial is important. Monitoring their blood pressure and achieving blood pressure goals, not just going on taking tablets, but actually achieving blood pressure goals is important. Eat healthy and keep a 
keep a diet that is healthy for your height. Staying hydrated is very important. Drink around two liters of water on a daily basis. Don't smoke. Smoking has not helped any organ in the body and it doesn't help the kidney as well. Do not take over the counter pills and I'll shortly allude to this again, which is very important for the pharmacist to know especially. And if you belong to one of those risk groups, that is elderly people, diabetic, hypertensive, previous kidney ailments, family history of kidney ailments or obesity, get yourself screened for kidney disease. And the screening is a simple blood test where we estimate the serum creatinine and then plot a GFR or what is the kidney speed. And we also do a urine protein analysis and see if the kidney is leaking any protein. Based on this, we come to know if the person is having any uh, dysfunction in the kidney. Now, uh, pharmacist plays a very important role in medical practice and more so in dementia, like Dr. Amit said, where you have to really take the time and patience to explain the patient the prescription. Also in kidney patients, it's very important that you are an integral part of the care cycle besides the dietitian, besides the nurses, besides the dialysis technician, transplant coordinator, a pharmacist, especially the hospital pharmacist, plays a very important role. Let me come to a few specific issues which the pharmacist can help with in kidney patients. Over-the-counter pills are bad for kidney patients, especially painkiller medicines. In this slide, we have tried to uh, you know, segregate aspirin, ibuprofen, diclofenac, and many of the other NSA drugs, which many times are being uh, you know, dispensed over the counter without a prescription to patient. It might help relieve that one day's pain for the patient, but the patient doesn't understand it and goes on taking these medicines in a long-term basis. So the root cause analysis of pain is very important rather than going on taking painkillers, which can have a bad effect on the kidney. Uh, if a kidney disease patient requires some pain relief, then paracetamol is the safest. Not just pain, uh, uh, pain patients come to you with uh, cough and cold. So it's, you know, giving some cough uh, suppressants might be containing some turbutalin or something which in, increases their blood pressure, which is not good for kidney patients. Constipation, if somebody has taken uh, unusual amount of uh, laxatives and is passing a lot of voluminous stool, that might cause dehydration and suddenly worsen his kidney function. So over-the-counter pills are a bad idea. Uh, on a long-term basis, can definitely affect kidney health. The other aspect is compliance because very often the prescription that is there for a kidney patient involves a lot of drugs, sometimes five drugs, ten drugs also. So it's very important that patients comply with all these medicines. These are some statistics from the US where they are trying to say that 30% of patients stop taking prescription before it runs out. One third of patients don't even tell their doctor that they have not taken their medicines. And about a lakh and 25,000 people die of treatable diseases simply because they did not take the prescribed medicines. So again, you pharmacists can play a very important role by emphasizing on compliance to medicines taking diabetes medicines, blood pressure medicines on time can help them prevent a worsening of kidney dysfunction. Another issue is of generic medicines because sometimes these medicines are quite expensive and patients don't comply because of cost factors. Yes, generic medicines have an advantage when it comes to cost and improve compliance, but certain uh, disadvantages are also there that many of the generic companies do not support research. But a very important disadvantage, especially in transplant patient, is that the bioavailability is variable. I'm not saying that uh, generic drugs are less bioavailable. It is just variable. Just to give you an example, tacrolimus is a drug that we use in transplant. And if the company brand is changed, then the bioavailability changes and the serum level of that drug changes. And that has to be maintained in a very narrow range. You must be knowing that certain drugs like lithium, like these tacrolimus and others have what is called as therapeutic drug monitoring. And if the brand is changed, then we have to again do the drug level and reassess whether the window is correctly achieved or not. My personal take is that patients who are not able to comply with medicines because of cost, we should encourage them to take generic medicines. But we should also be aware that the bioavailability might be a bit different. And then we have to retest them. And as far as possible, if they are able to afford using original molecules is a good idea because it's going to improve research and further our science going ahead. 
drug holiday sometimes is required for kidney patients especially when they are acutely ill uh, when they are acutely ill and blood pressure is low they should stop their blood pressure medicines especially if they are on ace inhibitor or an arb drug if they are acutely ill then they may need to switch to insulin from uh, oha medicine so a drug holiday sometimes is required for all these patients with kidney disease so just to share again the eight golden rules and i'll try and share this particular graphic uh, with uh, mr raj vaidya who can then send it out to all of you all which gives a nutshell of how to save your kidneys and how to promote kidney health so thank you for your patient listening and i'm uh, glad to take questions any thank you so much sir participants do we have any questions for dr amol does high serum creatinine affect eyesight see uh, most often patients with kidney disease are diabetic and diabetes affects the retina also and that's the reason why many times uh, kidney patients also have eye issues uh, second one is uh, can somebody yeah let me just enlarge this does tramadol also cause uh, fall in the category that may affect the kidney no Tramadol is actually safer for kidney patients compared to the other NSAIDs. Deferent no is for ibuprofen, diclofenac, ketorolac, uh, etorococcib, and all these NSAID molecules. Tramadol is safer, so we use what is called as a pain ladder. We use paracetamol as the first step, tramadol as the second step, and then very uh, few cases of cancer and all we could go to fentanyl, morphine, or something like that. So, but that would be with the prescription definitely. health is important than money so use as much as branded medicine yes definitely mr ganesh goswami has a point there whenever patient asks me this question actually i put the proposition to them in reverse when you want to go to see a movie do you go to the smallest theater in your city like you know i live in vasco so we have one small el monte theater here which screens some very few movies or would you go to inox so we go to inox we want the best when it comes to entertainment and then why to fool around with our health so if it is possible definitely branded medicines are better than uh, uh the generic ones are there any side effects of having too much water yes if you take more than 5 liters of water it can affects the kidney's concentration mechanism and people can get hyponatremia that is low sodium problem so uh, ideal quantity somewhere between liters and 4 liters around 10 to 12 glasses a day is what you should be drinking in a day a uh, pharmacist may be a very relevant point where you don't have easy access to toilet or something you know it it it's generally a problem in all uh, shops where they want to sit at the counter for a long time and avoid drinking water and have higher incidence of stones and other problems so it's important to drink a lot of water Mm, more than three. I think I answered that. Are there any specific steps that we can take in babies to prevent future kidney occurrence? Not really. If some families have something called as a polycystic kidney disease, then they should start screening their. Uh, you know, even intrauterine ultrasound is required to screen the baby. Uh, otherwise, not really. I mean, so there's nothing like neonatal baby screening for uh, kidney patients. If the kidney isn't functioning properly, then dialysis is the only step. Yes, dialysis is the final step. We want to postpone it as much as possible. But when that stage comes, dialysis is going to help improve the quality of life. Dialysis never in increases the quantity of life. So dialysis is not a cure. It is just a supportive treatment to improve the quality of life. If the patient is a young person, then instead of dialysis, going to a transplant. may actually improve the quantity of life also they might live longer after transplant sir in a person with nephrectomy how much water is required nephrectomy persons actually compensate for the loss of that one kidney and nephrectomy means basically removing one kidney now they are having only one kidney but they compensate for that loss and they are able to filter out whatever you drink so it's like you should drink the normal amount of water 
take intake for infants better to ask a pediatrician uh, madam purva what are the and she is coming next you could pose that question to poonam what are the precautions to take in case of shrinkage of one kidney see this is a bollywood concept ki ek hi kidney kharab ho gaya actually both kidneys get affected by the disease because they are exposed to blood pressure and diabetes equally only if you have stone on one side or a tumor on one side it would affect one kidney so it's never that one kidney fails and then the other kidney does diabetes compulsorily lead to kidney failure no 4% of diabetic patients have mild kidney ailment every year and up to 40% of prevalent diabetic patients have mild kidney dysfunction not all of them have kidney disease and by uh, controlling their diabetes and blood pressure and diet they could avoid kidney disease how do we manage fluid so early patients should uh, you know take normal amount of water it only when they start getting swelling and decrease urine output a doctor would advise to uh, reduce the intake substitute for terbutalin which is healthy for kidney in case of cold would be to prescribe bromexine something that is uh, you know not going to raise the blood pressure apart from checking creatinine which are the tests required to be done uh, basically for screening we only do creatinine and urine albumin if something is found then we do a whole panel of tests which taluka in goa is at high risk of uh, problem that would be kankon it has a slightly disproportionate incidence of kidney problems nobody knows why lot of research is being done but no definite answers till now what all foods to be had by nephrectomy see what is safe for kidney patients is less salt uh, more water and avoid fried foods reduce red meats that would be the important advice a specific advice has to be designed for a given patient but these would be the important points when it comes to diet in case of kidney transplant for a young person would a older parents kidney transplant help so we screen all donors ideal would be to have somebody below 60 years of age but we've had patients donate kidney even in their 70s as long as the kidney function is healthy and that answers the second question living with one kidney is safe as long as we have tested the person enough does creatinine increase cause kidney disease i think arbaz is asking about this creatinine supplements or muscle supplements in our, uh, gym going people yes increased load of protein puts a strain on the kidney patient on on the kidney for even a normal person and we have seen a few cases where it can lead to kidney disease uh ashwini is asking we are from kankon uh, we uh, means does it is it hereditary nobody knows madam nobody knows whether it's hereditary but yes there is a tendency that it runs in certain families so if that's why it is important to do that screening if you come from a area that has high incidence or if a family member had kidney problems you should go for screening at a young age so that we know if there is a kidney dysfunction and we advise these patients appropriately i think i have caught up with most of the questions yeah one more two more how to stop overuse of painkiller is to just do the root cause analysis find out what is the cause of the pain sometimes you know in a elderly patient for example knee pain may be a cause for going on taking lot of uh, painkillers simply doing a knee replacement surgery might be easier than exposing to so many painkillers and ending up on dialysis so i'm not suggesting that is for everybody but they need to see the correct doctor and find out what is best for them how much protein it is intake is harmful for kidney see ideal protein intake is 1 gram per kg body weight anything more than that you are loading your kidney key counseling tips Uh, most important avoid over the counter prescriptions compliance with proper medicines follow up with doctors and appropriate tests as as is ad advised so that we can change the prescription up, uh, accordingly these would be the most important uh, advice that what you could give to your patients pleasure no sarang i wouldn't say that they are dangerous see they are just slightly different so they need to be uh, appropriately handled uh, you know india should be proud of the fact that we are making one of the largest number of generic um, drugs and making it affordable 
and easy for patients to go on taking these medicines. So I'm not against generic medicines, just that they are different and then we need to monitor how they are affecting the patient. My concern is especially transplant patients where if you change the brand, the level goes different. And then we have to do the level again or see what is happening to the creatinine. So we have to be sensitive to these requirements. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening in. Yeah, so Evelyn, I think you should move to the next speaker. Thank you so much, sir, once again. Pleasure. So, participants, uh, Today is the birth anniversary of the Today is the birth anniversary of the founding father of pharmacy education in India Mahadeva Lal Shroff He introduced bachelor and master courses in the discipline of pharmaceutical sciences in India He edited the first Indian journal of pharmacy He was the first vice president of pharmacy council of India he also formed the Indian Pharmaceutical Congress Association, IPCA. There is a slight delay with our third speaker in joining. So requesting all participants to kindly wait for a while. As we wait for Dr. Poonam to join, there's a quick short announcement for all the participants in their feedback link. Please try and put your name as per your pharmacy council registration number. So then that helps us to track you better. The same that we were requesting you to put in your registration link. So that uh, helps us better to track so that we can send in your certificates at the earliest. We are saying it two weeks, but hopefully we'll be able to do it much before that. Sir, Dr. Poonam has joined. So our third speaker for today is Dr. Poonam Sambaji. She is a child specialist at Porvorim, North Goa. She was the honorary secretary of IAP Goa State Chapter for the year 2014-2016. She was also the honorary secretary of IMA Bardes Branch Goa 2020-2021. She was the chairperson of Mission Pink Health and Women Doctor Wing Bardes Goa 2020. 21. Dr. Poonam has a massive online presence. She is the creator of public awareness social handles like Dr. Poonam's vlog on YouTube. Her FB page and Instagram has more than 40,000 followers in total till date. Today, she will be delivering a lecture on vitamins and minerals for my child. Over to you, Dr. Poonam. Just a second, Evelyn, I think she has a little bit technical. Uh, she cannot connect to audio, I think. All right, all Just right. Just a minute, I'll talk
Hello. Doctor Pune, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I was not able to join in between. Perfect. Okay, but we are not able to are see you. you. Uh, actually, I have put on the video. I mean, video also I have uh, made on. One minute. Let me just try again. Sure. Can you see the video now? Actually, we can hear. Where did my PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, I'm just trying to share my PowerPoint. Okay. Actually, uh, not this. Um, share screen. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. So, our third speaker for today is Dr. Poonam Sambaji. She is a child specialist at Porvorim, North Goa. She was the honorary secretary of IAP Goa State Chapter for the year 2014-16. She was also the honorary secretary of IMA Bardes Branch Goa 2020-2021. She was the chairperson of Mission Pink Health and Women Doctor Wing Bardes Goa 2020-21. Dr. Poonam has a massive online presence. She is the creator of public awareness social handles like Dr. Poonam's vlog on YouTube. Her FB page and Instagram has more than 40,000 followers in total till date. Over to you, Dr. Poonam. We all welcome you. Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, a really big sorry for being late. <laughs> there was some issue in getting connected. So our today's topic will be on vitamins and minerals for my child. The most commonest question that the parents ask. And, you know, many times uh, they feel that vitamins and minerals are the only things that are the magic medicine in the whole basket of medicine. OK, so let's talk about the vitamins and minerals and the 10 topics that I'll be going through during this talk are, uh, I have given an overview here. So these are the most commonest thing that a parent should know and you as a pharmacist as well as a parent should know. First is what is the importance of these vitamins for my child's health? Second one, what should I know about vitamin D with respect to my child's health? Third is what is the importance of minerals for my child's health? What kind of food will provide enough vitamins for my child? what kind of food will provide enough minerals for my child so there are two things here are uh, vitamins and minerals so you may feel that the questions are being repeated but there is one difference over here vitamins and minerals okay the next one is how will i know if my child is deficient in any vitamins and how will i know if my child is deficient in any minerals eighth question that we come to we get is do i need vitamins and minerals supplement for my own for my child because this is one of the uh, one of the most demanded question in the opd when the parents come doctor can we can i have a mineral this thing multivitamin okay then what are the myths associated with the vitamins and minerals like effect on immunity and memory as well as can an excess of vitamin and mineral harm my child in any way so let's go question wise one after the other so our first question was what is the importance of of vitamins for my child's health. So here we should know that vitamins are essential nutrients that are required in small amounts to enable various functions in the body. And what we mean by essential nutrients is that we have to get this from the outside source. Not all vitamins and minerals are, pro are produced in our body. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, this uh, the children need vitamin for their growth, for their development, and for the normal functioning of the body. Okay, and the normal functioning of the immunity also. Now let's see different uh, vitamins. One is a uh, vitamin A. Now vitamin A is required for the functioning of uh, the uh, the eye. Okay, the visual health as well as vitamin A is also required in our immunity as well as for our skin health. The next we go to our vitamin B complex. Now vitamin B complex is available in varied vegetables and uh, uh, the, the sources we'll be seeing later on. Okay, it helps in various chemical reactions that help us to convert the food to energy. When we eat food that has to be converted to energy so that we can utilize it and form perform our different functions. Okay, so this vitamin B complex helps in various chemical reactions. Vitamin B12, it helps in the normal functioning of brain and the nerves because a lot of vitamin B12 is required for the sheath of the nerves as well as the sheath which is covering the brain. Uh, so transmission of the of the you know electric like impulses which are there in our brain uh, depend upon this covering of the nerves. We, and in that, the vitamin B12 helps us a lot. The next is our vitamin C. In vitamin C, it helps us. Uh, uh, repair our body, the wound healing, as well as our immunity. And it also helps in maintenance of bone health and teeth health. Now, these are the functions of vitamin that we are seeing. Okay, now vitamin D, vitamin D is required for absorption of calcium and for building the bones. And that's why we have shown the teeth as well as the bones here. Okay, because and vitamin D helps in absorption. Vitamin E helps in, it is an antioxidant, it helps in the cell repair. These days, a lot of talk is going on about antioxidants for the health. There are so many antioxidants coming in the bottle. A major one of that is vitamin E. Vitamin K helps us, uh, helps us in our blood clotting. Okay, uh, the, uh, remember that most of the vitamins cannot be produced by our body and we need to consume it in our diet. And that's why the word essential was used. The children of all ages need a sufficient intake of vitamin. It starts from newborns and infants, and they need them specifically because of their rapid growth. Remember, first two years of our life, there's a rapid growth. The older children may also need the additional vitamin intake during their recovery from any illnesses and when they are deficient. So when they fall sick, following that they may require, or if they are not eating otherwise well and they are deficient, that's why they may require. The adolescent also need adequate vitamins because again there is a spot of growth during this time and especially they require the folic acid and the vitamin B12 which they may be deprived due to the faulty dietary habits such as the junk food or maybe someone who is totally veg person okay they will miss the vitamin B12 uh, because during the uh, adolescence that is after the that is your teens there's an increased growth spurt. Now, what should I know about the vitamin D with respect to my child? Okay, so uh, as you know that uh, vitamin D is a nutrient that helps us absorb the vitamin the, and retain the calcium. Okay, and that's why the in turn, it helps us maintaining the strong bones and the teeth. It may also play a, a role in the immunity. Now, nowadays, a lot of studies are showing that it is it helps in immunity. And that's why the market is flooded with vitamin D tablets, gummies, powder, you name it, and you have it, even the drops of different strengths. Whether it has a role to play in immunity, okay, and uh, in many other aspects of the body functioning is a matter of debate and it is still being studied, as I said. Now, vitamin D is known as the sunshine vitamin. And uh, because the body can make vitamin D in presence of sunlight, and uh, that is because of the fatty layer, which is just below our uh, skin. So when the sunlight falls on our skin, there are different reactions which happen under the skin and they produce vitamin D in different stages in different parts of the body. Okay, so this explains us the traditional practice of keeping babies in the sun, as well as doing a lot of oil massage in the sun, not only of babies, but even of uh, adults, you must be seeing the bodybuilders and all, they usually get the massage done in the uh, the sun because especially the sun during the 11 a.m. to 
2 pm remember uh, many times you will hear people saying that we should have early morning sun rays for the better uh, vitamin d but the actual thing is we should have sun rays between 11 am in the morning to 2 pm in the afternoon that is when the vitamin d is maximum synthesized because the uvb rays in the sun are maximum during this time also remember that when we are having the sun suppose you want to sun bathe okay it should be with minimal clothes which are accepted um, traditionally also it should be in direct sunlight many of them may sit in front of sit somewhere inside a window with the window panels when it's a clear glass in between them remember this uvb rays do not percolate through the glasses so you will not get vitamin d synthesized if you are sitting inside the house with windows closed okay uh, now, uh, the, remember that uh, if in India, we don't have so many uh, fortified uh, food, vitamin uh, uh, foods which are fortified with vitamin D, which are uh, available abroad. So traditionally, we have to get vitamin D from the sunlight, which is the major source. Yes, there are minor, minor sources which are available in the food, which we'll see after some time. In India, availability of the fortified food is very limited. Since the diet is a limitation and sun exposure can, affect, is, can be affected by pollution, children with dark skin or people with dark skin and, other, uh, and there are many other limitations, vitamin D supplements may be required in this. And uh, that's why the newborn babies, especially the premature children, are being supplemented with vitamin D at least till one year of age, as well as people with and children with liver disease, kidney disease, and other clinical deficiency states, where uh, also when the children, when the people are taking certain medications, that time we require vitamin D supplementation. What does vitamin D uh, deficiency cause? Now, we all know that vitamin D deficiency will cause weakening of the bones. And this weakening of the bones is called the rickets in young children. Okay, And as a result of the rickets, the children get bent bones. So they are like bow legs. Okay, And they can be something known as knocked knees also. So bow legs is when the legs are bowed like this. So the curvature is outside. Whereas the knock knees is when the curvature is inside. Okay, So the knees are knocking each other when the child is walking. Walking. That's why it is knock knees. It can also lead when the deficiency of vitamin D occurs in the uh, in children below one year, it can also lead to delay in walking, delay in teething, and also increased risk of fractures and low blood calcium level, low blood calcium level further causing problems like seizures, which are also uh, recorded. Okay. Now, excess of vitamin D is also known because when you take too much of vitamin D, it's a fat soluble vitamin, so it is not. Uh, expelled from the body easily it remains in the fat of the body so it may cause a uh, problem if you have excess of vitamin d okay now what is the importance of minerals in our body okay now we already saw the importance of vitamins in our body body now we are seeing the importance of the minerals in our body so the minerals are the chemical elements that are necessary for overall good health now specifically they help in maintaining various functions of the body example calcium is necessary for formation of bones for formation of teeth for the muscle contraction because it is one of the main element in contraction of the muscles okay for all the not only the muscles the 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 uh, what you say the skeletal muscles okay these are this muscles okay but even for the heart muscles the intestine muscle okay it is also important for the clotting of the blood and for the relay of the electrical and the chemical messages which go in the cells what i told you for in the first or second slide i told you about the brain and the and the nerves okay the relay of electrical and chemical messages which occur like suppose today i want to talk here right now my brain is functioning my brain knows what all things to talk okay my eyes are seeing this for a few words which are written behind over there and and my brain is relaying it through my nerves to my tongue where I can uh, articulate these words and get across to you in communication mode. Okay, So all this is happening because my mineral levels are proper. If there was a problem with my mineral levels, then definitely there would have been a problem here. Okay, There might have been delay in the relay. There might have been delay in my speech. There might have been mismatch of the speech. So all this is re requires all the uh, minerals and one of them is calcium okay it controls a lot of uh, processes in the in the life okay second one is phosphorus now phosphorus and magnesium are also needed to keep the bones strong and they are also important for working of all cells in our body 
even the sodium, potassium, and chloride are also called the electrolytes because they transmit the minute electrical currents generated by the nerves and within the cells. When, the, when someone has loose motions, we know, we know that we are supposed to use the WHO ORS formula, right? This WHO ORS formula also has the minerals, sodium, potassium, and chloride, which help us in giving, relaying the electrical currents which are there in the body. And if these electrical currents are not there, we see that the child or the person who is having loose motions becomes delay, uh, becomes uh, sluggish, cannot do the regular activity, feels very weak. So this is the importance of the minerals in our body. Next, we come to the iron. The iron is a crucial information of the hemoglobin, which carries the oxygen to all parts. And oxygen is required for each and every part of our body for the normal functioning. If someone stops my oxygen, I will start having headache. I will not be able to perform my normal, normal work. Okay, so that's the importance of iron, which is helping you to carry the oxygen to all the parts of the body. Okay, it is also important for many parts of enzymes because it's for the enzyme working because it facilitates the chemical reactions that happen on on daily basis in the body and it also plays a role in the immunity iodine we come next to the iodine as the mineral iodine is a raw material which is needed to produce our thyroid hormone and again thyroid hormone is extremely important for development of our brain and if there is a thyroid deficiency in the infant or in the newborn it can have devastating effect on the development of the baby okay even the mental development as well as the physical development of the baby in fact the thyroid uh, hormone inf uh, influences each and every part of the body and they are like the master of the orchestra of all throughout our life okay so thyroid hormone missing there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the body next we come to the zinc as the mineral zinc plays an important role in the immunity nowadays again we are having a lot of zinc floating in the market as well as this is very important for our gut health and you must be knowing that it is prescribed during loose motions also because we lose it during the loose motions Next, coming to fluorine, it is important for our teeth and bone, and that's why we find it in our toothpaste. Okay, what are the kind of food? Now we come to our kitchen, the food where we provide all these vitamins and minerals to our child, or vitamins. In this section, we will see the vitamins. Remember, all these multivitamins or the vitamins that parents ask, or you as a parent may ask, okay, are available in your kitchen. You should only know how to withdraw them from that food, okay? Now, different foods are rich in different vitamins and uh, minerals. So, regular consumption of all the wide variety of foods of different type, of different colors is very important to provide enough vitamins and minerals in our general uh, in, in our general diet. Okay, so generally fresh fruits and vegetables are very good sources. Now we will see all the sources here. Example, the vitamin A. Now vitamin A, there are plant sources here, which are like green leafy vegetables, spin, like spinach, amaranth. Okay, most of the green and the yellow fruit vegetables, example, papaya, mango, pumpkin, carrots, all are very high in vitamin A. Uh, animal sources are very less in vitamin A. The other sources are the fortified foods such as the fortified ghee, fortified uh, the dalda, the margarine, and the fortified milk. The, remember, the darker the vegetable, the green leaves, the higher is the content of the uh, iron. Also remember that we require, this is a non-heme iron. Okay, so uh, the uh, the, uh, this is a non-heme A, vitamin A, okay, that is, uh, it is coming from the plant sources, and uh, as, as I said, the darker the vegetable, more is the vitamin A. Coming to the plant sources of vitamin D, first in my talk, I had told vitamin D, the major source is the UV rays of the uh, sun, okay, so the plant sources are very limited, one which we know is mushroom, animal sources, again, this liver, egg yolk, butter, cheese, and fish, and the fish liver oil, very minimal amount of vitamin D we get in this, okay? Remember that it is produced in the body by reaction of ultraviolet rays on the fat layer, which is just under our skin and, and is stored in, uh, the fat layer is in a, uh, a great amount in our skin, right? So the UVB rays fall on that and they, can, they start a chain of reaction, which gives rise to the vitamin D. Vitamin D is also available in the fortified foods such as milk, vanaspati ghee, and in the infant food. 
UVB rays can be blocked by pollution, by dark skin, as well as by uh, glass panels. Natural foods alone cannot meet the daily recommendation of the vitamin D. That's why in infants, we need to, um, we need to supplement it. As well as in adults, sometimes we may re require supplementation because it is not normal for, I mean, it is impossible for us to eat 10, 10 eggs, 20 eggs in a day to get the daily recommended uh, vitamin D, right? So now let's go to the vitamin E. Vitamin E is the uh, is distributed almost each and every vegetable and fruits. You should, that's why you should eat each and every vegetable and fruits, especially the fresh uh, fruits as well as uh, you know the the raw fru fruits and vegetables. Vitamin K, the fresh green vegetables are very high in vitamin K. Again, as it is more darker ones, have more vitamin K. Also, the main source is produced by our probiotics in the gut. So the gut bacteria, the good bacteria which are there, they are also producing this uh, vitamin K within our intestine. Coming to vitamin uh, B complex, now B complex is available in all the green leafy vegetables. It is available in milk, in eggs, the meat, the liver and the fish. Okay, the whole grains and cereals and pulses also contain small amount of vitamin B, but it is a so it is a it is a important source because of the because the quantity in which it is eaten. Also remember more soaking and germinating of the cereals as well as the grains and the beans will increase the amount of vitamin B complex in our diet. So sprouting is a very, very important, uh, uh, important, part, important type of process that you should be doing in your, in your kitchen because sprouting will give rise to a, a wide variety of vitamin B complex in your diet. Coming to vitamin C, vitamin C is available in plant sources such as fresh lime, fresh fruits, green leafy vegetables, germinating pulses, as I said, the, the sprouts, okay, amla, guava, okay, and other, the, it is, remember that it is destroyed by heat, so it is very important to eat the food, uh, fruits uh, fresh, okay, don't, uh, and also vegetables, uh, which will give you vitamin C should be taken as salads more than as cooking. Vitamin B12, there is absolutely no plant source as such, but animal sources are air, air, milk, egg, meat, and fish. And that's why we find that many uh, vegetarians, the pure vegetarians who do not even eat egg, have vitamin B12 deficiency, which can lead to type of anemia. Let's come to the question five of us. What kind of food will provide enough minerals for our child? So all this while we saw all the vitamins. Now we are seeing the minerals. Okay, the major minerals are those which are required in large quantities and trace elements are those which are required in small quantities. Okay, so the calcium is something which is required in large quantities. Um, uh, uh, try to imagine the bone structure that we have. The entire bone structure requires vitamin D. Okay, so the custard apple is a very high source of vitamin D. Green vegetables, cereals, and millets. Mind you, you should be including this even in your children's diet. The more than six-month-old child, when you start them on complementary diet, all these things should be included in that, okay? The animal sources such as milk and milk products, example, cheese, curds, skim milk, and buttermilk, egg, and fish should be also included in everyone's diet. In children below one year, we do not give animal and milk, okay? So can avoid that. Mother's milk as well as other uh, fortified milks can be given during this time. Poorly absorbed green leafy vegetables and uh, CD, uh, uh, vitamin, calcium is poorly absorbed from green leafy vegetables and cereals because of the presence of oxalates, which uh, decrease its absorption. But processes such as just simple sorting of the vegetable, that means a little bit of cooking of the vegetable, uh, then uh, other stuff such, uh, such as sprouting of the food, soaking of the food, uh, food uh, the, I mean the cereals and the pulses decreases the oxalate levels and increases the absorption of calcium. Ragi is a rich, rich, rich source of calcium and rice is a very poor source of calcium. And that's the reason ragi is a, is a well-known item in, uh, in the, in the uh, complementary feeding of children. Usually you will find children being weaned on ragi porridge. Next, we come to phosphorus. It is widely distributed in all the foods which I have told for calcium as well as I'll be telling for the rest of the uh, food items. Phosphorus is there almost in all the food items. Iron, 
iron is widely distributed in all the green leafy vegetables okay so uh, uh, green, cereals green leafy vegetables legumes nuts oil seeds remember when we say oil seeds mostly people will think only of what uh, groundnut okay but oil seeds also include sunflower seeds pumpkin seeds these are some seeds which are not eaten on a regular basis and i recommend that you should start eating sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds on a regular basis okay uh, then jaggery and dried foods are all, are also there but again iron from non heme sources these are the non heme sources that is the plant sources is poorly absorbed as compared to the heme sources that is the animal source the animal source of uh, iron is liver meat poultry fish iron is better absorbed from the heme source that is the animal source and more so if you use a lemon along with it and that's why in india we have this uh, we have this you know uh, the ritual of having lemon along with the non veg food because it increases the absorption of the iron with that uh, in, with use of vitamin c which is in the lemon okay milk is a very poor source of vitamin uh, iron as well as it can hinder the absorption of iron that's why children more than 9 months of age should not sorry should not consume milk more than 500 ml in a day okay pure vegetarians are usually at a risk of deficiency again because of the non heme iron which is not absorbed uh, which is absorbed poorly we come to the sodium now sodium is available in our common salt in our pickles okay in our fried items okay and is present in many other food its requirement depends upon the physical activity the uh, more the physical activity you have the more uh, sodium requirement you will have require the potassium the potassium is available in fresh fruits like sweet lime banana papaya coconut water these are very high sources of vitamin uh, sorry potassium and that's why they are recommended in during loose motions now many parents ask me doctor if i have banana is my baby going to get loose motions or the loose motions will become more worse no <clears throat> banana is a very good source of vitamin uh, sorry potassium so you should have it potassium in the body may reduce after few few days if you do not eat it like a short period of illness can be you can be deficient in vitamin uh, in potassium so you should have fresh fruits always and that might be the basis of gifting a sick person the fresh limes and the banana which we go with okay instead of uh, the flowers better go with the fruits for a uh, sick person then is the iodine the iodine is a small amount of iodine in various foods and in water depending upon the soil content of the iodine it is very rich in sea foods and they are uh, especially the shellfish okay shellfish are also also very high in biotin and uh, vitamin b uh, in biotin okay so it is very important and in choline which these both things are very important in our in our brain function occasionally cabbage and cauliflower which may not allow the absorption of the iodine that's why you should not have too much of consumption of cabbage and cauliflower next coming to fluorine fluorine is available in our tea in our seafood and in our cheese the main source of fluorine is our drinking water <clears throat> which is fluoridated and a toothpaste which are again fluoridated next we come to the zinc which is again widely distributed especially in meat fish milk as well as the shellfish the deficiency may occur in the undernourished children and after the diarrheal disease and that is the basis of giving vitamin uh, zinc in a uh, diarrhea patient usually the food usually uh, almost always provides all the trace elements and their excess can harm so they should not be supplemented as such let's go to our question number 6 i am still more pending four more questions okay so question number 6 is how will i know if my child is deficient in any of the vitamins we uh, so the deficiency of vitamins can be seen as certain symptoms the following so the following complaints in the child may suggest that there is vitamin deficiency but the doctor needs to confirm that so and so vitamin deficiency is there so as to give the supplement for the same like vitamin a the child may or the even the adult may have dry eye may find difficulty in seeing what others can see very clearly like night blindness can be there they have wrinkled and brownish spots on the white area of the skin of the eye okay that then there are uh, they suffer from infrequent uh, the sorry they suffer from frequent tummy infection even chest infections because of the uh, vitamin a deficiency 
the vitamin B deficiency is the next. The vitamin B deficiency may cause fatigue. So our battery goes down. Okay, there is a lot of fatigue. There may be headache. Delay in achievement of the normal milestones can be also there, like stand, delay in the standing, delay in the speech, the developmental delay. There can be sore lips, okay, and the sore or the ulcers on the tongue. Nerve-related complaints like pain or tingling numbness in different areas of the body. There can be mood changes. There can be muscle weakness. There can be impaired balance so walking may be imbalanced okay or fine motor may be imbalanced they may not be able to hold things like they might be shaking they may not be able to put the thread in the needle so many things may happen okay vitamin c vitamin c deficiency may may present as a swelling of the gums bleeding of the gums while brushing easily getting bruised with trivial trivial injury which may which should not usually cause any bruising as such then pain in the limbs swelling in the limbs slow wound healing dry hair dry skin these are all vitamin c deficiency symptoms vitamin e deficiency is very uncommon and vitamin k deficiency usually occurs in special situations which your doctor will be able to diagnose okay now we go to the question seven how will i know if my child is deficient in minerals just now we saw the the vitamins now we are seeing the minerals okay so the different complaints which i have to which i'll be telling in the tabular form next may suggest that there is a mineral deficiency okay example calcium there's a calcium deficiency now calcium is the biggest source biggest this thing mineral that we require and its deficiency can cause a varied type of problems okay there may be uh, there may be uh, defi uh, vitamin deficiency is usually due to vitamin d deficiency the calcium deficiency is because of vitamin d deficiency so the same symptoms like pain in the bone bo bowing of the bone okay rickets that can occur in calcium deficiency also besides there'll be a lot of muscle cramps there will be occasional fits because of the lower vitamin uh, cal calcium which is required for the nerve function as i said especially it occurs in babies okay Iron deficiency can cause tiredness, anemia, so tiredness, lack of concentration, inability, uh, irritability, then poor appetite, they may not be taking enough of food and they may look pale. Iodine can cause lethargy, deficiency of iodine can cause lethargy, delay in development, swelling of the front of the neck, that is the goiter, okay, then uh, uh, not growing in height, so stunting can be there. Sodium deficiency will cause muscle cramps, weakness, potassium deficiency will again cause weakness, can also cause heart problems, okay? Coming to the next, do I need a vitamin and a mineral supplement for my child? Again, the commonest question which is asked by the parents. Now, if the child is consuming, now if you have properly um, weaned the baby or put the baby on a proper complementary feeding and not just Okay, if you give something like this, your child will never get all the multivitamins and multi, I mean, the minerals and the vitamins. You require to give them the proper diet, which will have all cereals, whole cereals, which will have all whole pulses, which will have been uh, vegetables, which will have uh, this thing, free fruits. So it is very important to have a proper, proper complementary feeding. Now, for all those parents who are watching me and are in the reproductive age group or for all the grandparents who are watching me, please note down this one name of the channel, a YouTube channel, which is by IIT Bombay. Its name is... Uh, 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 what is that um, spoken tutorials okay spoken tutorials uh, uh, or health spoken tutorials it is health spoken tutorials okay now this channel is a beautiful channel which will tell you exactly how to wean your baby i get many queries even on my social handle and as I, uh, the evelyn told my social handle now it has crossed 60000 followers okay i get almost every day more than 200 uh, questions or so asking only this okay how do i wean my child how do I wean my child? Please make a video on weaning my child. But uh, Health Spoken Tutorial channel by IIT Bombay has actually made a beautiful videos, okay, not video, but videos on weaning the baby. So if any one of you require the weaning the baby information, please go to that channel, see those videos, go according to that. And if any of your parents or friends also require, please share that, that channel with them. Very, very important information which is going through the IIT Bombay, okay? And it is, it is a very... Uh, authentic source of information. <clears throat> 
Now, in general population, many children do not get enough of vitamin A, and that's why it is supplemented in the government health centers. If you see every six, six months, vitamin A is given. Okay, because the vitamin A is not enough in the in general population, there are ill effects of deficiencies like night blindness, skin problem, eye problem, and everything. As well as since they are undernourished, they can have measles and the long-standing problems of the measles, such as long-standing diarrhea, then chest infections. Okay, so in this case, or such cases, we need to need to give the vitamin A supplement. Now, since young babies are growing rapidly, and even one cannot rely just on sunlight for our vitamin D supplement, vitamin D absorption, because the color of the skin may be different, the timing that you are exposed may be different. You may be sitting inside the window with the door panels closed. Okay, that's why the supplement of vitamin D of 400 international units per day is required till the child is one year old without missing. Okay, if the child has missed, we complete that one year later on. Okay, as much as possible, see that they do not miss it because otherwise we have children with fractures, easy fractures, okay? They just have a fall and they have fractures. The child who has a diet which is poor in iron may need iron supplementation. Example, uh, the adolescent girls who are already menstruating and not having a proper, uh, proper diet are more onto junk food, then they will require iron. As much as possible, see, to see that you all don't eat the junk food so that your children see you and don't eat the junk food, okay? Zinc supplementation, zinc may be also required as supplement and need to be supplemented in the undernourished children and after a diarrheal supplement. On any on an individual basis, you may discuss with your doctor for whether the whether individual vitamin uh, supplementation or multiple um, uh, multivitamin and uh, multivitamin and mineral supplementation is required in your child. Now, what are the, now coming to the ninth question, these are the myths that are associated with vitamins and minerals. Okay, certain complaints in children can be related to the deficiency of vitamin and minerals, but uh, many, the absence of, uh, but in the absence of deficiency, the same complaint can occur due to some other reasons and will not be sorted out by just giving supplementing vitamin, uh, vitamins and minerals. Like maybe some psychological problems will not be supplemented uh, by solved by just supplemental. Okay, for example, deficiency of iron can contribute to learning difficulties or to poor appetite. But in absence of deficiency of iron or any other vitamin or mineral does not strengthen the, the, the memory as well as the boost the intelligence or the stipu, uh, stimulate the appetite of the baby. Okay, many of them say, okay, doctor, I want the baby to be strong. Can you give me multivitamin? So just by giving multivitamin, the immunity will not increase. Okay, above normal levels of vitamins and minerals also do not confer extra immunity and with uh, Quiets, uh, water soluble vitamins are uh, anyways lost in the urine, so they are totally waste. Many of the benefits which are claimed for vitamin D, like the improvement of asthma, is also unproven. Then the aches and the pains in the children may be due to various reasons. So vitamin D alone cannot give the solution. Example: growing pains. Growing pains will grow. I mean, grow out with the as the baby grows. Okay. Another misconception is that vitamin A will improve the eyesight. So many parents, when the child gets glasses, will start increasing the intake of uh, all the orange vegetables and say, oh, I'm trying to take all the orange vegetables, still the glasses are not uh, going away, okay? So just by increasing the vitamin A, your eyesight is not going to come back to normal or you may not correct the refractory error which is there already there in the child the vitamin c does not prevent a cold so many people during this covid time have started popping up the vitamin c tablet every day and the vitamin c uh, sale has uh, gone skyrocketing but it will not stop your normal colds and coughs when the supplementation are needed the products sourced from abroad are not necessarily superior to the local ones so because i have many patients who are like no doctor i will get that medicine from dubai because it is very effective okay it is not necessary it depends upon company to company and uh, how it is produced in the company whether it is produced in india or abroad okay Let's go to the number question 10. Can excess of vitamins and minerals harm my child in any way? Yes, excess of anything is poison and it holds true even for medicine and minerals, okay? And it can cause serious health problems. Like vitamin A is often prescribed for some skin problems in high doses for a long time. And some of them believe that uh, cod liver oil and capsules are very good for health. Now, when these high dose preparations are consumed, it can accumulate in the body, and there is something known as 
pressure in the head okay it increases the uh, blood pr the pressure inside the skull and because there is increase in the skull pressure it can lead to fit especially in children okay then is the vitamin d supplementation the the extra vitamin d supplementation can also accumulate in the body and can cause damage to the kidney and sometimes even damage to the heart because a, a huge number of vitamin d's are available as gummies and powders which are very 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 tasty okay so the children are tempted to take them they are even produced in very very uh, tempting uh, packages okay next coming to iron a toddler can accidentally chew some sweets or coated with iron tablets uh, prescribed for an adult in the family which can lead to overdosage and serious consequences because the iron doses in children goes according to milligram per kg okay so it has to be that many milligram per kg to make up so we cannot give the adult uh, uh, preparation to the child also excess of sodium can contribute to high blood pressure and that we all know vitamin b complex and vitamin c are the most sober vitamins okay they do not accumulate in the body because they are water soluble and they do not cause any harm if consumed in excess that's how though the vitamin c and vitamin b complex have been popped up very high during this time not many are having any side effects of vitamin b and c because they'll be flushed in your toilet the next day morning when you pass urine you will see very dark yellow color urine with a <laughs> with a very odd smell which is there because of the vitamin b and the vitamin c that you consuming in excess amount i think that's it for today and thank you i know i've run a little bit faster because i didn't want to delay uh, Ev uh evelyn are you there any yes, questions for me any questions for me participants if you have any questions for dr poonam please put it in the chat box uh, how do i get away with this so, um, ah, stop share yeah actually i'm not able to see my own video god knows why ma'am there's a question ha huh. uh, what is the ideal ml of water that an infant must take especially now that summer will start okay so who is this purva i think no yes purva has asked i don't know where can i see the in the chats where do i see the question in the chats yeah chat box ma'am yeah yeah so what is the ideal ml of water that an infant requires purva good, very nice question so uh, the, depending upon the age of the child the ideal intake of the water will change like we have to start water when the baby is 6 months of age in case of a exclusive exclusively breastfed baby but in case of a baby who is on top feed in that case already the water is going while preparing the formula milk okay but you should not increase over and above that level okay so that is number 1 so when the baby becomes 6 months of age the intake of water should be from 6 months to 8 months it should be 30 ml to 100 ml per day more the better also remember please do not add sugar uh, jaggery then body shape all these things and make a flavored water because ideally the baby should take a non flavored normal water the way the way the water tastes that is tasteless okay as the baby grows from 8 months to 9 months the baby should take around 100 to 200 ml per day okay and one year and above should be taking at least 300 ml per day okay that is around one and a half glass per day as the baby crosses um, 12 to 15 kilos they should take on an average 800 ml to um, 1 liter of fluid in a day now where i mentioned fluid here because it will be the milk the fruit juices as well as the water the baby is taking okay so what is the next question one minute hi doctor can we give fruit purees uh one minute let me yeah so um ideal ml of water child have urine infection then how to do how to do the child have urine infection it needs to be treated with the proper antibiotics and the proper investigations first the investigations and then the antibiotics uh, that is sarita gaude then divya uh, or trupti digambar has asked me a question what is the channel name you are suggested by it is health spoken tutorial okay health spoken tutorial by iit bombay on youtube channel 
then uh, uh, next is amita naik has asked hi doctor can we give fruit purees to 6 month baby what is the ideal age yes of course you can give fruit purees to the 6 month old baby you can give so many fruit i usually prefer to start apple because it's my favorite okay i start apple for most of my babies who are who follow up with me so at 6 months usually i see to it that the baby has a strict follow up of uh, the type of food that i give and the parent doesn't give anything else from home because there is too much of you know blah 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 coming from all the people at the Will tell mama. Will tell mummy. Will tell everyone. Will tell something or the other, uh, and they mess up the uh, this thing, the complementary feeding. So I'm very strict with my patients. I tell them six month follow up has to be there, and it has to go the way I'm telling for the first two weeks, and after that I hand over them the channel uh, channel so that they can go accordingly. Uh, I think there are too many questions coming in. Yeah, uh, yeah. There is a need to print. Okay, this is something else. Uh, now, yeah, should we avoid using antibiotics on children? Yes, of course, we should use uh, the, avoid using antibiotics in children because uh, the antibiotics don't only have good effects but even bad effects. Like normal cold, we don't require to use antibiotics. Uh, there are so many times that even in diarrhea, we don't require to use antibiotics. Okay, so as much as possible. Possible see to it that they are not used unnecessarily, like over the counter use of antibiotics. Um, then where am I? Okay. Uh, did I miss any question, Evelyn? Must... Yes, doctor. There's a question from Rupali. Yeah, age of child. Age of child. That one. Yeah, yeah. Evelyn. Yeah, age of child is eight and two. Eight months. Okay, two teeth are fallen. Uh, it is eight years or eight years. Eight years. Two teeth are fallen, but still, almost after five months, now the teeth don't come. So, is it necessary to give extra calcium and vitamin D supplementation uh, from Rupali? Not necessarily. See, teeth sometimes takes time to come out. So they they are in the process of coming out. If the child the uh, <clears throat> the teeth fell beforehand, that is, the child had some injury and the teeth fell, then. the teeth which is below it will take its own time to come out but anyways it would be better to take a uh, uh, take a consultation of a dentist to see where exactly that teeth is so accordingly it can be decided uh, then my son was having mouth ulcers last week so i started b complex should i continue with the same yes you can start but again it depends upon the ashwini it depends upon the <clears throat> the re reason for ulcer now ulcer is not only a sign of uh, vitamin b complex deficiency it can be also vitamin c deficiency it can be because of the trauma in the mouth it can be abnormal bite in the mouth the bite bite means the type of bite that the child is having so all these thing need to be seen uh, <clears throat> then is uh, there some more uh oh, thanks a lot thanks a lot informative session thank you for that informative session uh five years she has urine infection problem uh okay but that urine infection problem no miss sarita i think needs to be seen by your doctor so please visit the doctor uh, on urgent basis maybe by tomorrow it was really good knowledgeable session thank you kimi krishna korgaukar but i think i really ran very fast through the session because of all the all the gadbad that happened at the start of the session Okay. Yes. So, uh, anything else? Mm, yeah. Many thank yous coming. Yeah. You all are most welcome. Yeah. Any more questions, uh, Evelyn? That you can see. Um. um Ma'am, what about children who don't eat fruits? Uh, so, Oppo A three, the ones who don't eat fruit, you have to put them into habit of eating fruit. Uh, you know, the same child will be the one who will eat all types of uh, these things, chocolates, if you uh, provide them to them. Okay, because. it is the availability when we were small the availability of chocolate was so so rare that we had to eat the vegetables and the fruits right similarly now the availability and the advertisability of stuff has increased so much that your child sees the chocolate first before the before your fruits so see to it that the <clears throat> exposure to the media is very very minimal zero below 2 years of age so that the child doesn't see only all these outside thing and even if any friends and friends or anyone is coming and uh, before 1 year of age okay is trying to uh, uh, gift any uh, sweets please tell them please give fruits so that the child only sees fruits that is very important we have to change our habits 
Snehal, child is two and a half year, oral vitamin and mineral syrup is important to growth. Which one? Again, as I said, the minerals and uh, syrups are not important. The good food is important. So I think, uh, Snehal, you should see this health spoken tutorial, the food, how to prepare food high in protein, how to prepare food high in magnesium, calcium, and vitamin B complex. There are separate videos on this. Please see that and try to put that in your daily daily cooking habits so that not only children, but even you all will have a good source of vitamins and uh, pulses, uh, vitamins and minerals, okay? Um, yes, many thank you. Thank you. Yes, you all are most welcome. I think anything that I missed, Evelyn, please see the questions. I can see too many thank yous. Yeah, I uh, think... Ma'am, there's a question. Should we give B complex and vitamin C to kids in the current COVID situation? So now COVID situation is almost coming to an end. So I don't think so. You should pump them up with too much of vitamin B complex and C. But yes, as I said, the foods rich in vitamin C and vitamin B, you continue to give. Uh, normal, Ashwini asked me, normal quality, quantity of uh, quality quantity of water to be given to five-year-old kid now depends upon the weight of the child if a five-year-old kid should ideally be 17.5 if, if it's a girl child if it's a boy child should be around 19.2 uh, kilos okay so accordingly you should require at least 1.5 liters of fluid in these children now what is meant by liters of fluid means it should be water intake food, fruit juice and the uh, milk or whatever liquid the child is taking okay that all should make up at least 1.2 to 1.5 Five liters okay ideal weight uh, then thank you uh, then thank you mm. uh, Gautami says thank you doctor all sessions were very informative thank you then ideal weight for eight month old baby boy depending upon the birth weight but should be ideally at least eight kilos uh, I give A to Z syrup to my child yeah it's okay yes I think yeah that's it the questions as of now anything else you can see Evelyn no, ma'am. I think it's all covered. Yes. Okay. Evelyn, do you do you see my video? Can I get a screenshot? Because I can't see my video. No, ma'am. You're not visible. You all can see. What is the problem most probably? It's just a black screen. Ah, uh, what is that? It's only a black screen that's visible. Yeah, even I can see the black screen. Uh, okay. Yogi, uh, any yeah. idea what's wrong? Even I have no idea. I'm just taking. Don't know, ma'am. I think there is little bit glitch in the video setting of yours. Uh, but left. you, huh? There is a setting called video. You can click on that and uh, click there on video. There is that setting. left hand side stop video is there. Uh, right. Once click on. Yeah. Bye bye. See you. Thanks a lot. Bye, ma'am. Yeah. Karsh, could we move back to the presentation? Okay, requesting all the participants, please fill the feedback link that is posted in the chat box. And y'all can expect to get your participation certificate within 15 days via your emails. And please make sure you enter your name as per the um, GSPC registration. Yogi, have you put the link?